Hello everyone, for this final module I've condensed two chapters into one module. So this, um, this lecture recording is actually going to be in two parts. And we're going to begin today by talking about artwork from the year 1900 to the year 1945. So during this time period, what were two of the most influential events? Of course, World War I and World War II. World War I was the first war to use modern technology in warfare, and up to that point, point in time, it was the deadliest war um, that had uh, thus far been undertaken. More than 9 million soldiers were killed. And then following World War I, there was World War II, which was then also the deadliest war in history, and it's estimated that about 50 to 85 million people died as a direct result of World War II. So the World Wars forced people to reconsider reality and launched the world into the modern age. Modern art as we know it would not exist if the World Wars hadn't taken place. I have an image uh, on the top of the trenches of World War I and the trenches and trench warfare and also poison gas were all inventions of World War I and then of course the most famous invention of World War II was the atomic bomb. And this greatly affected the psychology of the people of the time. We're going to begin by looking at um, some artwork that would fall under the broad term of avant-garde. And avant-garde is a term in French, which comes from a military term, and it literally means front guard. Uh, literally, the front guard were the troops that were sent ahead of the army to make the first strike. But this military term was taken up by artists and was used in art history to describe artists who were ahead of their time. And avant-garde artists uh, reject the commonplace and push the limits of art making and of commonplace society. So all artists of this chapter you could say were avant-garde during their time. That term was used during the time period but was also used retrospectively and I dare say you might hear this term used today. So now you'll know where it comes from. We're going to begin by looking at the work of the German Expressionists. The German Expressionists were a group of artists who used very bright colors, distorted forms, ragged outlines, and agitated brush strokes to express anxiety and pain in their artwork. Kirchner is a famous German Expressionist, and because we're trying to move through these time periods fairly quickly, I'm trying to choose the most representative works of each artist, but Kirchner, if you're interested in printmaking, made a number of really beautiful woodcuts and worked with black and white as well. During their time period, the German Expressionists um, were met with a lot of resistance and a lot of people thought their work was very hideous, but in retrospect, their artwork looks so contemporary it seems almost as though this could be made today, although this is a street in Dresden at the beginning of the 1900s. So Dresden is a city in Germany that would later be very devastated by World War II. But here we have a sense of agitation and congestion and anxiety that very much is still characteristic of city life today. We see an interest in the modern world. Here, Emil Nold, one of Kirchner's contemporaries, is taking on a religious theme if you look at the title, St. Mary of Egypt Among Sinners, but St. Mary doesn't look particularly religious herself, or perhaps she is a deeply religious figure. It's just all dependent on one's definition of religion. And we get a sense that the artists of this time period were really trying to reconsider religion and indeed um, all aspects of quote-unquote civilized society. Let's look at some cubism. What is cubism? Well, it's a style of artwork, and one could say it was developed by Pablo Picasso and George Brock, although who exactly developed cubism is the subject of much debate. Cubists were not trying to describe visual reality, so they weren't trying to make things look quote-unquote like a photo. Instead, what cubists wanted to do was um, fracture and dissect everything around them, and they were trying to paint every part of an object instead of just painting how it appears from only one angle. Cubit art, cubist artwork itself is flat and abstracted. It's usually low in color, which is just a stylistic choice. 
and it's usually of still lifes because still lifes don't move so it's easier to try and tackle a um, representation of every angle of them although some cubist works do take on the human form. Pablo Picasso is an artist that you've probably seen the work of somewhere and he worked within the cubist style but he worked across many styles. Uh, he's quite famous and I think that this quote by him is an interesting quote to help you think about the artwork of this time period. On the left, uh, I want you to take in a little picture of Picasso as a young boy on the upper left, and then uh, Picasso in later life. So this quote is, We all know that art is not truth. Art is a lie that makes us realize truth, at least the truth that is given us to understand. The artist must know the manner whereby to convince others of the truthfulness of his lies. They speak of naturalism in opposition to modern painting. I would like to know if anyone has ever seen a natural work of art. Nature and art, being two different things, cannot be the same thing. Through art, we express our conception of what nature is not. What is Picasso trying to say by that quote? Well, he's trying to say that Obviously, a painting of a woman, no matter how exact it is, isn't a woman. It's a lie. It's a representation of a woman. And I think by that quote, he might also be saying that painting something that doesn't look as naturalistic as we might be uh, expecting might actually be more true of one's own experience. In other words, trying to represent experience is sometimes more honest than trying to create what appears to be a visually accurate representation of something. Take for example this which is one of Picasso's most famous paintings, The Ladies of Avignon. Uh, one can assume by the title and by the way that these nude women are arranged within what might be some kind of architectural space uh, that these are perhaps women in a brothel but Picasso isn't representing them in any traditional way. We see a combination of flattening, uh, which is an aspect of cubism, of showing things from various angles. We even see what look like masks on the faces of two women. Picasso was very influenced by African art, and he would often go to museums and copy it. Uh, he wanted to try and represent the feeling of reality as opposed to reality itself. When this painting was unveiled, it was met with a lot of critical horror and people really hated it, uh, but the controversy that surrounded it uh, forced people to reconsider their view of art and of value within artistic practice. Here's some other cubist artworks by um, Picasso's contemporaries. This is, here we have Brock. This is a, a image of a bottle, newspaper, a pipe, and a glass. And you can see that a piece of newspaper has actually been glued directly onto the canvas. So there's a certain amount of flattening that happens because everything is shown at a very kind of flat perspective. So you can see the most important elements of each object. But even the actual object itself has been glued onto this artwork. So we have artists thinking not only about different ways of representing reality, but of different ways of working with material. Here is another very famous image of Picasso's, Guernica. And I was talking about how the world wars affected artists of this time period. This is a very direct reaction to a terrible event that had happened, which was the bombing of the Basque uh, city of Guernica. And Basque uh, land is a part of Spain. And this bombing was undertaken by fascists, and most of the people that died in the bombing were common people that had nothing to do directly with the war. So Picasso painted this mural um, in, uh, as a direct reaction to this event. It's said that Nazis entered his studio and saw an image of this painting and they asked him, uh, did you do this painting? He responded to the Nazis and said, no, you were the ones who did it. Which again is an interesting view on reality and artwork's relation to it. Let's look at some Dada artwork. Uh, so Dada artists celebrated the absurd, and their work was often nonsensical, nihilistic, funny, and or pessimistic. One could say that their mindset could have been a result of the chaos resulting from World War I. When you hear the word Dada, I suggest you think of Marcel Duchamp and Man Ray, 
who are two of the most important Dadaists. And Dada isn't unified by a single style. In the words of André Breton, who was a famous surrealist, he said, Cubism was a school of painting. Futurism is a political movement. Dada is a state of mind. Uh, here is an excerpt from the Dada Manifesto, and a manifesto is a public declaration of what you stand for and what you do. So the Dada Manifesto, Dada knows everything, Dada spits on everything, Dada says nothing, no thing. Dada has no fixed ideas, Dada does not catch flies, Dada is bitterness laughing at everything that has been accomplished, sanctified, Dada is never right. No more painters, no more writers, no more religions, no more royalists, no more anarchists, no more socialists, no more police, no more airplanes, no more urinary passages. Like everything in life, Dada is useless. Everything happens in a completely idiotic way. We are incapable of treating seriously any subject whatsoever, let alone this subject, ourselves. So one could say Dadaism is a philosophy that verges on, uh, verges on nihilism. Here is the most famous Dada artwork. This is Fountain by Duchamp. This is the quote-unquote second version. Uh, the original version was produced in 1917, and Duchamp, the name of the artist here, produced several versions of Fountain. As you can see, Fountain is a urinal that has been turned on its side, and it is signed R. Mutt, which is the fictitious name of this artist, Marcel Duchamp, and it's dated. Uh, Marcel Duchamp was an artist who believed that the most important part of an artist's work wasn't the actual physical work, but it was the thought that went behind the work, so in other words, the concept. And that's very much reflected in this work here. It's a ready-made, which is to say this urinal already existed, but what turns the urinal into a piece of art is the fact that Marcel Duchamp claims that this is an art work. And that's all it takes to make an artwork an artwork. Now whether or not that is something you agree with could be, uh, well, endlessly debated. And this work here is the subject of almost endless debate, which I can't quite go into in this lecture in the interest of time. But I encourage you to think about it. I want to show you some other Dada artworks. This here is a collage arranged according to the laws of chance, which is to say that these little squares of paper were cut up and then um, our Hans Art claims to have just randomly dropped them on the sheet of paper and glued them wherever they landed. They seem to have landed very neatly, so perhaps the artist is lying. Um, but that's part of the charm of Dada is if they could absolutely be lying. Nothing is real. And Dada artwork asks the viewer to challenge everything. Here, this is a work by Man Ray. The title of it is Gift. Um, and Man Ray did actually present this as a gift. But what kind of gift is this? It's a iron with nails glued to the bottom of it. So not only is it heavy, it, it's also useless. And it's also another example of a ready-made. So some uh, objects that already existed were rearranged by the artist, and then the artist claimed that they were art. Is it art? It's the concept that makes it art. Do you think that's art? Again, these were all questions that were being asked at the time. Um, some people who definitely agreed that Dada art was not art were the Nazis, and a lot of these artists were... Um, persecuted during their lifetimes, and some of them were jailed, some of them were killed as a result of making art. Let's look at some surrealism. Surrealism is an art movement that sought to release the creative potential of the subconscious mind. Surrealists are very interested in dreams and things that are irrational. This is a quote from André Breton, who was a surrealist thinker. Surrealism is based on the belief in the superior reality of certain forms of association, heretofore neglected, in the omnipotence of dreams, in the undirected play of thought. I believe in the future resolution of the states of dream and reality, in appearance so contradictory, in short, of absolute surreality. So the surrealists sought to unleash the potential of the subconscious mind, and um, bridge the, the realm of the subconscious to the realm of the conscious through their artwork. Artists like Georgia de Chirico 
would work often from dreams, pulling memories from childhood, and combining them uh, with elements of the real world to try and create artworks that were evocative of or reminiscent of, but not about any one thing in particular. Other surrealists were slightly more absurd. For example, um, this image by Magritte called The Treachery of Images. And this text in French says, the text that's painted on the painting, this isn't a pipe. But of course it's a painting of a pipe. So one would say, well, of course it's a pipe. But it's not actually a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. And if you think about a painting of a pipe, it's actually just paint on, in this case, canvas. So uh, surrealists were trying to challenge the idea of reality and of what we see. What is, what is real, exactly? And what do the objects that we live with in our everyday life really symbolize? So here we have, um, this is Object by uh, Marette Oppenheim, who happens to be a female artist. And it's a fur-covered cup. This is the fur of a rare Asian deer. And... A cup is a cup and saucer is a fairly common daily object, but surrealists were interesting in, interested in subverting reality, often with erotic undertones. In this case, uh, the fur of the deer is meant to remind you of pubic hair, and in in this case, the cup itself becomes a vaginal symbol. So the common objects of our daily life start to turn against us when we. Um, uh, try and view them through the lens of the irrational. Salvador Dali is perhaps the most famous surrealist here in The Persistence of Memory. Um, we have clocks that have melted and we have the ants crawling out of the face of the clock, one of Dali's favorite recurring themes. Um, and it's, it's not exactly abstract, and it's open-ended enough that it can mean a lot to a lot of people and has been used throughout popular culture. And then finally, um, 20th century Mexican artists. Uh, this here is um, a quote that explains Mexican art, and I wish I could give it some more time, but again, in the interest of time, I'll keep this brief. Uh, art has always been employed by the different social classes who hold the balance of power as one instrument of domination. Hence, as a political instrument, one can analyze epoch after epoch from the Stone Age to our own day and see that there is no form of art which does not also play an essential political role. What is it then that we really need? An art with revolution as its subject, because the principal interest in the worker's life has to be touched first. It is necessary that he find aesthetic satisfaction and the highest pleasure a parallel in the essential interest of his life. That should be paralleled. I wrote it wrong and I apologize. The subject is to the painter what the rails are to a locomotive. He cannot do without it. In fact, when he refuses to seek or accept a subject, his own plastic methods and his own aesthetic theories become the subject instead. He himself becomes a subject of his work. He becomes nothing but an illustrator of his own state of mind. That is the deception practice under the name of pure art. So uh, the 20th century Mexican muralists were interested not in trying to portray something that was uh, very cerebral or existed only in the mind, such as the artwork of Dada and surrealism. They were trying to make artwork that would uh, appeal to the masses. So this here is a work by Roscoe that is very critical of American uh, civilization, specifically capitalism, and it glorifies the the working class and the, the struggle of the poor. This is Diego Rivera, who that quote I read uh, earlier is from, by the way, and a section of his mural of ancient Mexico from the National Palace in Mexico City. And in this section, you can see a glorification of the imagined history of peoples before the um, colonization and genocide uh, took place as a result of the arrival of Europeans and it's a very illustrative artwork and it's meant to appeal to everyone so not only people at the higher classes this would have been in a public space where people could see it readily to a lot of the European that artwork that we have looked at uh, throughout 
all this course was meant to appeal to the upper classes, but I want us all to keep in mind that that's only one small section of the art world. And that concludes this lecture. Thank you.